every worldview requires some decision of faith. I don't mean just religion faith. Decision of what you will believe. Even an empirical that is based on five senses of, of the scientific method requires some decision of faith. Why do you believe your senses are reliable? Mm -hmm. yeah. Why do you believe that your cognitive faculties lead towards truth? Mm -hmm. If we are just the result of survival by the fittest, we don't operate with 100% certainty. That is a myth of the enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And when we clear away that myth, there's actually a level ground. The question is not whether you will have faith. And again, by this, I just mean belief in something. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even have to be religious faith. The question is not whether you will have faith. It is where will you place your faith? Mm -hmm. And everyone places their faith somewhere. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Advent Next, a theological podcast curated for curious faith discussions. This week, we are continuing our talk with Dr. John Peckham, professor of theology and Christian philosophy at Andrews University. If you haven't already checked out last week's episode with him, now is the time to do so since we'll be picking up our conversation, starting with the New Testament Apocrypha, like the Gospel of Thomas and Judas. We'll also be looking at some textual criticisms that test the reliability of scripture, and we end with looking at some myths of the Enlightenment that deal with certainty, including how the practice of faith is present in every person's worldview, regardless of whether one is religious or secular. If you're not already following us on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, be sure to find us at the handle at Advent Next. My co-host today is Michelle Odinma. You can find her at the handle at Michelle Odinma Music. I'm your host, Kendra Arsenal, and this is Advent Next. So kind of moving into the, the, the New Testament, uh, looking at some of the neo-Gnostic uh, movements that kind of arisen and are, are re-arising. I remember kind of when I was coming to try to understand, you know, what foundation we have for believing the Bible. I remember going to the bookstore. I picked up a big, you know, Gnostic Bible. It's like this That's, big. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm reading through the Gospel of Thomas and I'm reading through the Gospel of Judas. And I think a, a big narrative mm -hmm. around those types of literature is that mm -hmm. these were excluded from New Testament canon because they gave a message that uh, you know, people didn't want to accept, but they're actually more true because yeah. of whatever reason, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so what do we do with that? Yeah. So there's a number of things that, that, mm -hmm. that I would want to say there. First of all, I would want to remind people that there isn't anything like governing authorities that could sideline books and writings mm -hmm. until at the very earliest, the fourth century. Mm -hmm. And already by the second century, uh, late second century, because most of these books are not even written yet. Uh, the earliest, some of them could be written, like the Gospel of Thomas is around AD 150. I'll come back to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. But around the end of the second century, you already have church fathers that are telling, warning people about these books and pointing out that they are inconsistent with the very story of Jesus that given to us by the apostles. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is read some of the, the Gnostic writings, the neo-Gnostic writings, to see how very different they are from the gospel testimony. Mm -hmm. so around AD 180, Irenaeus gives an argument. He says, I was taught by Polycarp of Smyrna, and Polycarp of Smyrna was taught by John the Beloved. Mm -hmm. So I, there were only two generations removed, and we know which books actually come from the apostles, mm -hmm. and the Gnostics yeah. are fabricating stories and claiming they're apostolic, and that there's some secret wisdom that comes from the apostles, but they really don't. And you don't just have to trust us telling you that, that we go back to the original apostles, and we're the ones who actually bear the writings of the apostles, but just compare them to the story that's told. Irenaeus gives this analogy. He says, the Gnostics take sayings and other things from Jesus, and they rearrange, rearrange them like taking a beautiful portrait of a king and rearranging it into a portrait of a dog or a fox. Mm. It's a completely different story. <laughs> it's a completely yeah. different theology. And most of, of Irenaeus's five books against heresies are actually just recounting what the Gnostics taught because mm -hmm. he thought just by actually saying it out loud was enough to refute it. Wow. Mm. So <laughs> with regard to one of those books, I want, I'm pulling out my phone because I want to get this right. I don't want to misquote it. Um, but the Gospel of Thomas and other of those so-called Gnostic writings, they're discovered among a group of, of writings uh, in the desert called the Nag Hammadi writings, mm. at least many of them. And they don't go back uh, to the apostolic time. They couldn't have been written by apostles or close associates. They're too late. Mm. So the Gospel of Thomas isn't written by Thomas or anyone associated with the Thomas, who was the apostle. Okay. Same with the Gospel of Judas. The Gospel of Judas, we didn't actually have what was in the Gospel of Judas until recently it was discovered. Mm -hmm. But Irenaeus himself writes in Against Heresies 1, he talks about that very book. He calls it the Gospel of Judas. And he says, the Gnostics come up with a fictitious history as if Judas was actually mm -hmm. in cahoots with Jesus, so to speak. Right. They come up with a fictitious history of this kind and they call it the Gospel of Judas. In other mm -hmm. words, it's just a different story because the Gnostics were trying to promote, say, we have the secret teaching teachings. Mm -hmm. Nobody else has them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And what Irene, one of Irenaeus' arguments is, yes, they're coming up with this and they're trying to claim they have secret teachings because those teachings can't be attested. Mm 
Mm. But if Jesus commissions apostles to give us teachings right. we should follow, they're not going to be secret. Right. They're going to be something that can be attested and sure. passed down. And those are the writings that we call the New Testament. Mm. Now, when it comes to the Gospel of Thomas, the earliest it's written is around AD 150. It can't actually come from Thomas. So that already fails the first criterion we talked about. Sure. But I just want you to hear a section from the Gospel of Thomas. <laughs> okay. You probably know what's coming. Uh, it says in the so-called Gospel of Thomas, which is not good news in my opinion, at least that's part of it. Simon Peter said to them, let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Ooh. <laughs> Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> now, if, you read, if you've ever read the Gospels and you read that, this sounds nothing like Jesus. Sure. The opposite of the entire tenor of Scripture. It's obviously inconsistent. I'm not saying it's always that obvious when it comes to Gnostic or other writings. Yeah, sure. But this is obviously inconsistent. It's obviously teaching a very different worldview, a very different theory. And this is what the Gnostic communities would do. Christianity is popular, and so they would mm. take their very eccentric, weird theories, which are very much an, a, a kind of elaboration and running off in a particular direction from some Platonic and Neoplatonic philosophies, and they are trying to piggyback on the popularity mm. of the, the of Christianity wow. mm. and lead many people in a different direction. Wow. So those books, and, and the Gospel of Thomas is the one that has like the best chance. It's the closest one because around 8150, right. which isn't to say it's very close. We just simply don't have any extant books after those New Testament writings that are even close to coming from the first generation apostolic community and that are consistent with past revelation. Mm. Yeah. I think in the sum of, of all that was said, <laughs> right, the average person, uh, the average Bible reader, the average Christian just wants to know, is the book that I'm reading in my hands, is it legit? Is it something that yeah. I can trust? Is it something that random people put together? Or is it actually something that, you know, I can stand on? Yes. Um, so for the people in your church congregation or the people that, um, you know, you're ministering to or the people like us who just sit down and read our Bibles, yes. can, are we okay? When I read, am I going to be okay? <laughs> so I, I think there's good evidence that the, the biblical books that we have are those divinely commissioned by God to function as the rule. And again, the simplest way to think of it, right, the simplest way to think of it is which writings are the rule prescribed by the ruler himself? Mm. Who is the ruler? Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the one who rose from the dead. And if he really ratified the Old Testament, I think there's good reason to believe that we have the Old Testament he had, and he says things like the Scripture cannot be broken, mm -hmm. the New Testament authors say these things happen so Scripture must be fulfilled, then we have the right Old Testament. And if those New Testament books really are traceable to the apostles that Jesus commissioned himself, commissioned to actually testify about him, these are unrepeatable witnesses to the greatest event in history, yeah. which is the, the ministry of Christ, the incarnation, and the resurrection of Christ, mm -hmm. which the faith of Christianity hinges on. Yeah. If those are the writings that are attested by the ruler, ratified by Christ the Old Testament, commissioned by Christ the New Testament, then those are writings that we can trust. Yeah. Of course, for those who don't already <laughs> trust Christ, that raises a, a different set of questions. Yeah. Is Jesus really who he said he was? Mm -hmm. And I would just encourage listeners to look into that more. There is a lot of evidence that Jesus is who he said he was, not only in the Gospels, but also in, in other uh, external sources, including just the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth himself, yeah. and good reason, independent reasons to believe that he actually rose from the dead mm -hmm. in the first century. Mm -hmm. So people that are interested in reading, a very readable, uh, very uh, friendly book to read is a book by Lee Strobel called The Case for Christ. Yeah. And I would recommend that. Strobel himself was actually a journalist who was an atheist. His wife converted to Christianity and he wanted to deconvert her. So he went on an investigation to disprove the claims of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And he ended up basically studying himself into the Christian faith. And this book kind of gives a survey of those reasons to believe mm -hmm. that Jesus is who he said he was, that he really rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. Another resource to, to look up would be uh, Gary Habermas's work on the resurrection. Mm -hmm. He gives what he calls a minimal minimal facts argument for the resurrection. He takes a collection of facts, five or six facts, that the vast majority of historians, even atheists and agnostic historians, admit those facts are true. Like Jesus really died on the cross. He, there are believers of his that thought that they had met the risen Jesus mm -hmm. uh, and a number of others like James being converted, Paul being converted. These facts that are accepted by historians, not because they believe the Jesus tradition, but because the way Habermas puts it, they're all independently attested by at least 10 mm -hmm. 
independent hmm. kinds of testimony. Hmm. So even historians admit, accept these minimal facts. Yeah. Then he puts them together and he says, if all of those things are true, mm -hmm. the most probable outcome, the best explanation of all of these facts is that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. Yeah. So there's a lot more, more evidence. Now, there'll always be room for faith. Right. And there's always mm -hmm. also room for doubt because mm -hmm. God gives us freedom to believe, which I believe is necessary for love. But there's a lot more evidence than many people are aware of. Most Christians, I think, have never been told about these things at all. Mm -hmm. So I just yeah. want the listeners to know it, it is out there and there are good resources to look into these things. Uh, and somebody who might be on the fence, first of all, if you want to look for the evidence, you can go there. But I'd also say just read the Gospels yeah. and meet this man, Jesus of Nazareth, yeah. and ask if he does not speak to your heart, mm -hmm. if he does not testify to the biggest questions of your life. Mm. And eventually, if you're willing to entertain the possibility it's true, whether the Holy Spirit witnesses to you that it is true, which I believe the Holy Spirit will do. Jesus says, if anyone is willing to follow my word, he will know. Yeah. He says this in John 7. Eventually, maybe not all at once, and don't get discouraged. I'm not saying there's going to be a lightning bolt experience. God works with us, meets us where we are. Mm. It can be a very organic experience. It can take a lot of time. But just be open to reading the Gospels and asking, is the worldview presented here does it ring true, right? Mm -hmm. The values of love and mercy and justice, the greatest wants of our world today, I believe are testified to in the witness of Jesus because mm -hmm. Jesus wasn't just a mere man. Sure. He was God in the flesh and the God of love, mm -hmm. the God who meets the needs of all of our hearts. Right. So it is, is the canon closed? You know, what we look at in the New Testament, it says, you know, God's going to send the spirit of prophecy. People are still going to have dreams. And so, you know, you have other faith religions like Mormonism who says, well, we believe in the spirit of prophecy. And so we believe that our prophet, uh, you know, he, he, he belongs in canon. And th the further revelation that was given to this person, um, if it contradicts the, the stuff that happened before, it's okay because we have mm -hmm. uh, a living God who's now speaking to, through this person. So is the canon closed? And what do we do with, uh, you know, modern prophets? Yes. So I do believe the canon is closed, but I don't believe it's closed because mere humans say it's closed. I believe that it is closed historically and organically. It is closed in virtue of what the canon is. So if we go back to what we said a little bit earlier, I think with one of Michelle's questions, you have this process where earlier, uh, later rather, revelation or purported revelation of prophets are tested by earlier prophets that have been attested, going back to Moses, right? Mm -hmm. So you have this process where earlier revelation has to be tested, later revelation, I'm sorry, has to be tested by earlier revelation that, that is known to be canonical because God himself actually attested to it. He attests to Moses and on and on. Mm -hmm. If the books are those prophetic and apostolic books, if it is a covenant witness document, if it is those writings that testify to the events of old, the Old Testament covenant, God's miraculous events and testimony, uh, the ways of living, the law, etc. And if the New Testament are those writings that testify to the greatest covenantal event in history, yeah. which is the new covenant brought by Christ, uh, which is consistent with the Old Testament, but is a new covenant because God in the flesh comes to be yeah. with us, right? right? This is unmatch, unmatch, matchless, cannot be matched. Mm. If it really is actually a covenantal witness to the New Testament, then it's going to be closed once you no longer have those first generation eyewitnesses to Christ. Mm. So those apostles are eyewitnesses to Christ who can testify mm -hmm. Jesus really came. So the Christian religion is unlike most other religions. It, it's not, its claims are not just in the ether somewhere. Yeah, It's not just transcendent mystical claims. It actually rests on whether these things really happen in history. Mm -hmm. Was there a Jesus? Did he really rise from the dead? Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians 15, if he did not rise from the dead, our faith is in vain and we are of all people the most to be pitied. <laughs> yeah. So these are historical claims. And that means they have to be attested also historically. Mm -hmm. And so this once this first generation has passed, there's no other apostles that can attest to the unrepeatable Christ event with the mm -hmm. kind of authority that is given to them by Christ himself. Sure. So any prophet that comes later, and I do believe there are later prophets, even at the time of Paul, there are other prophets that were not canonical prophets. And he says in, in 1 Corinthians 14, well, they have to be tested by the apostles, yeah. Yeah. right? And 1 John 4, 1, John says, test the spirits to know whether they're from God. The yeah. Bereans in Acts 17, they... They tested the words the apostles are telling them by the scriptures to see if these things were true. Right. And, they're, and they are lauded for doing so. Mm -hmm. The apostles don't say, just believe it because we said it. Actually, yeah. actually consider the source. Yeah. So once you have this in place, any later prophet has to be tested by this 
canonical revelation. I don't mean canonical in the sense of a community says it's canonical. I mean in the sense of the rule, the measuring stick, the ruler Trinsic. that is given to us mm. yeah. by the ruler himself. Mm -hmm. It is historically the greatest witness you could have to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if Jesus is who he said he was, once, though, once that generation passes, any other later claim to the gift of prophecy has to be tested by that revelation mm. and nothing can match it until Christ comes again. Sure. Once the ruler has come, he sets the rule. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And until he comes again, anything else is to be tested by that rule. Mm. So what are things like, you know, um, you know, like Ellen White in the Adventist tradition um, is said to be a prophet, had visions with God, apparently has met Jesus in some stances. So why... Um, why wouldn't her writings be accepted as canonical, being that they are a, a testimony of a person that apparently that she met? Right. Yeah. So the main reason they wouldn't be canonical is because they don't come in that line of covenantal prophets and apostles. Mm -hmm. So there's there's no other witness other than the scriptures itself to test her by. Mm -hmm. So you and there, there are other people. I do believe Ellen White is a true prophet, mm -hmm. but I don't believe she's a canonical prophet. And in mm -hmm. fact, the easiest way to see she's not a canonical prophet is she will tell you if you read her right. writings, right? <laughs> yeah. Which is one of the reasons I believe she's a, a true prophet, in fact, because if somebody yeah. comes on the scene and says, add me to the canon, that's a really big red flag <laughs> right. right at the outset. Like, eh. And there's a lot of people that can fake it for a while sure. and they're trying to grasp for authority and grasp for, pro for power. She's doing the opposite. Yeah. She says in her writings, my writings are a lesser light to, to lead to the greater light. Mm -hmm. She says the Bible and the Bible alone is our rule of faith. She mm -hmm. talks about the canon being closed, but she says even at the time the canon was being written, God gave other revelations, which is true. Right. There were prophets that were given testimonies that aren't in the canon. Right. And she says in the last days, God has also given prophetic revelation, but not as a new rule, mm. not as a new rule of faith. So she's always pointing back to the scripture. She says, if people had studied scriptures the way that we should have, uh, there would not have been any need for her writing. So I do believe that God gives her uh, prophetic visions mm. and dreams and prophetic testimony that is helpful for this Advent movement, uh, but I do not believe that it is canonical because it, there's nothing that could be attested in the way that the New Testament apostles were attested and attested to the Christ event. Mm. Yeah. And if you open up the canon again, so to speak, well, then what are you basing it on? It's no longer the canon of Christ. Because even though I do believe she met the risen Christ, there's no way to independently attest that except sure. by testing it by the canonical testimony, is that making sense? Right. Which is what she says to do with her writings. Mm. So if you don't go that way, you're going to have anyone that claims they have a vision or a dream, as long as right. they claim it comes from Jesus, then they're a prophet. No. Yeah. Right. The reason Seventh-day Adventists believe Ellen White's a prophet is because we believe she meets the tests of being a prophet that are laid out in Scripture. Mm. One of them is that uh, they are actually accepting Christ and accepting the authority of Christ and many other kinds of mm. criteria of what we think a true prophet is. But all of those can only be judged based on the canonical canonical writings. Mm. So what if there was this hypothetical, we missed a book yeah. and, um, uh, and, and it's not in the canon? And do we have all that we need in the, our current Bible and in the canon to be saved, yeah. to understand salvation, to get yes. a, to, yeah. This is another reason why, why another independent kind of reason that suggests the canon is closed because you may recall that Jesus told his apostles that he was going to give them the Holy Spirit yeah. and the Holy Spirit would lead them into all truth. Sure. And he's specifically talking to that first generation apostolic community, which means they have sufficient revelation. The revelation given uh, through Christ to them is sufficient for what God wants us need to know, need to know specifically for salvation purposes. It doesn't mean other things cannot be known. Uh, when it comes to whether we might have missed a book, there's two different levels of questions. Is there some book outside of the canon that maybe should be in the canon? Um, I don't think we have any extant books. I think they just they just don't don't meet the criteria. Mm. Uh, different people can come to different judgments on that. But at that point, you're just dealing. You're really working around the edges of the canon. Mm. Uh, you you have very strong reason to believe this common canonical core that's accepted by nearly all Christians actually right. goes back to true prophets and apostles. Mm. But another question some people may ask, and it might be what, what you're getting at, is what if we discovered one of the lost letters of Paul, for instance? Yeah. Right. right? Mm -hmm. There's other letters in, in the letters we do have from Paul. He writes about other letters he wrote that we don't have anymore. And the sure. question is, what if one of those was discovered in the desert somewhere? Well, um, I'd be very interested in seeing something like that. Yeah. And I might not be able to conclusively say it did or did not come from Paul. Mm -hmm. So I would probably remain on the fence and say, I'm not sure. One of the things a writing like that would lack with regard to our ability to recognize it would be it's it, the testimony 
of the community at the time, which doesn't yeah. make it canonical, but gives us evidence. Yeah. If nobody else had this book, nobody quoted from it, right? right? It, it could be a very clever forgery. Yeah. So if what it's writing was consistent with, with past revelation, I would say, oh, this is interesting, good for reading, but I'm not going to give it its own independent authority because it might not actually come from the source. And if it taught something that was uh, an aberration, it could just be a very clever forgery. Mm. By the way, on that, when it comes to the New Testament, just an, an interesting fact. If you take the writings of the church fathers from the second to the fourth century, mm -hmm. if, if all of the other Greek manuscripts, thousands of them that we have, were somehow lost to us, if you had just the writings of the church fathers from the second to the fourth century, the entire New Testament could be reconstructed except for just a handful of verses. I think it's like 11 verses really? mm -hmm. that are actually quoted in those church fathers of the second to the fourth century. And that wow. leads me to my next Before question. any councils are actually... <laughs> That, supposedly oh, yeah. voting. Hmm. That's so interesting because my next question was going to be like, so how would somebody know that the writings that were present in the first century yeah. are the ones that we have today? How do we how do we right. know that that this is what they actually yes. said? Yeah. yeah, this is a this is a question of textual criticism, and textual criticism is the discipline. It doesn't criticize the text. Mm -hmm. It's a close analysis of which writings we have uh, that are earlier and and more trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And so the textual critics have a way of dating writings when they were written, and we have a very large collection of manuscripts that go back to very early, especially when you compare the testimony of the manuscripts we have of the Bible to other ancient writings, yeah. which historians generally take as reliable or actually coming from, from who wrote them. So we have very early writings. We have good reason to believe when it comes to the New Testament, the Gospels, for instance, are written within the Synoptic Gospels, uh, most likely within 30 years mm. of the death and resurrection of Jesus, which is very early, sure. which means you can't have kind of outlandish legends creep in mm -hmm. that quickly because the community is still alive much longer than that. The original apostle right. community is alive. Yeah. So it's very, very early, early testimony, especially when you compare it to other biographies like the biographies of Alexander the Great. They're centuries after his death mm. before they're even written. So you never know. Like, you never know, right? No one can say he's lying. Yes. <laughs> they, they go back to these apostles and yeah. these apostles tell you they're trying to write history. Mm -hmm. And because most of them were actually martyred for their faith right. and got nothing for it, right. that counts as evidence that they really were telling the truth. If you're making up a story about somebody who rose from the dead, it's not getting you anything because they weren't getting <laughs> external right. power. And somebody yeah. says, either recant your belief in this man or die, and they don't recant, right? <laughs> There's a the strong witness. evidence right. pointing in, in one direction, right? right. So you have uh, these, uh, these early apostles that are pointing to these books um, that I think counts very strongly in favor of these writings actually going back. Then you have the how early, how close the writings that we have, or the copies of the writings that we have, are to the original writing. And they're also quite early mm. compared to other ancient documents. And then once we have the documents, if they come from the second century or the third century, the fourth century and beyond, mm -hmm. if we know when they come, you can compare them. You can say, the fifth century document, is it roughly like the second and third century documents? Mm. And they are, there's an amazing consistency in the text, there are variants yeah. uh, called textual variants, but typically we can tell when a variant came into the tradition. Mm. And there's only a very small fraction of textual variants that are called both meaningful and viable. Mm. Now I'll need to take a step back to explain what that means for yeah. it to have any meaning to, to your audience. But Daniel Wallace, who's one of the foremost New Testament textual critics, he runs a center at Dallas Theological Seminary that's collecting one of the largest collections of and digitizing many of these uh, early manuscripts of the New Testament. Mm. He says there's four categories of textual variants. There is... Uh, uh, like spelling errors, spelling errors are very minor errors. That's like seven, roughly 70 or more percent of the variants. Mm. So it changes nothing because yeah. everyone knows what's, what's, what's being said. And there's other kinds of, of, of variants that are untranslatable. Mm. Uh, so some of them, like Greek is an inflected language, meaning the word order doesn't change the meaning except emphasis. Okay. And so you have a lot of variants like that that don't really change the meaning. Mm. Uh, and that's another large set. Then you have what is called meaningful but not viable. Mm. So there are differences that would make a difference but they don't show up in any manuscripts until late in the tradition. So all of a mm. sudden in the eighth century, you have this variant and then it's copy, and then it shows up. So you can see it came in there Literacy. probably accidentally by some scribe. They used to write marginal notes and sometime a later scribe would think it's not just a marginal note. Mm. It's actually part of the text and it might okay. mistakenly get copied or some other variant. is just a slip of the pen or, or something like that. In any case, they can see when it came in. So it's not viable. We know it doesn't go back to the original writings. Mm -hmm. okay. And that leaves you with these meaning, meaningful mm -hmm. and viable, which is less than 1% mm. of the textual variants. Mm. And they're viable, meaning they could go back. We're not sure whether this reading or that reading goes back to the original authorship. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're viable and they're meaningful, meaning they would change the meaning of that individual verse. But even those particular verses uh, don't, don't have anything like earth shattering that change 
major doctrines. And so the way one uh, scholar puts it, he says, we have the New Testament in a form that is 99.5% pure, by which Mm. we have strong reason to believe it actually goes back to the original writings. Mm. We have strong reason to believe those writings actually go back to the apostles that are witnessing to the risen Christ. So again, uh, it still requires decisions. Um, You can, you could poke holes. It's not a matter of saying deductively, Mm. these cannot be doubted, Sure. right? But all of the evidence, I shouldn't say all, but the the weight of the evidence points in this direction that these books really do uh, go back to the testimony of those apostles who died for their faith. Mm. Yeah. I think we tend to wonder about, what about that 0.5%, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, is there something there meaningful that would change the the course of history and the, the yeah. way that we view salvation? But apparently it seems like even if there was something different from the thrust of everything that is in the New Testament, it wouldn't change much. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it seems like it wouldn't change much. So, and one way for people uh, just in their own study, if you, if you study with a good commentary... Mm. A good scholarly commentary, or if, you, if you use it as a reference, it will tell you when there's a textual variant that we don't really know which is the verse. And you'll see that there, there are generally minor differences. And again, it's a very small, small fraction of the New Testament. So it, it doesn't change. Mm. Very, an individual verse, it might change something, mm. but it doesn't change something about any central or core doctrine of the faith. There's no kind of earth-shattering revelation that if you mm. take this variant, then then there's some very different teaching. And so it's really amazing when you realize w- how this came down to us yeah. without technology, with very faithful scribes and monks preserving these writings, copying mm. them over and over and over again. We really mm. owe them a debt of gratitude wow. for yeah. preserving these writings, often under very severe persecution, especially in the early centuries of Christianity. Mm. And this is why these kinds of conspiracy theories that you have this kind of group that is suppressing other writings. The Christians aren't suppressing anything. Yeah. They're running They're running they're dying for, for their it. life and dying <laughs> yeah. for their faith. Yeah. They don't have any power until around the time that Constantine comes. Uh, but by then, you already have this trail of witnesses, this cloud of witnesses, excuse me, mm-hmm. cloud of witnesses to the revelation of Christ and the manuscript testimony. Wow. And, and I've even heard of experiments where, you know, professors will take a, a Robert Frost poem and they will hand it out to their students and yeah. they'll have it copied yes. and then they'll have 40 copies and they'll give it to somebody and say, can you get back to the original? Because there'll mm-hmm. be spelling errors or maybe somebody fell asleep and didn't finish the poem or, <laughs> right, or skipped yeah, a word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and, yeah. and that with, with relative accuracy, the person who goes through all those scripts, they can actually mm-hmm. deduce the 100% what was originally intended to yeah. be said. Very, yeah, there's a very strong degree of confidence among text textual critics, both believing textual critics and unbelieving textual critics. And if you use, like in the, the apparatus of the, of the Greek New Testament, the critical editions, it will give you a grade in there that tells you how confident they are of this reading, if there is a variant, right? Mm-hmm. And many of the grades are very high, meaning they have a very high confidence, the community of scholars. But for somebody who doesn't have access to a Greek apparatus, which is most people, yeah. uh, you can see where the variants are if you just go to a good library and consult a good commentary if you're dealing with a particular text. Um, and then there are some some kind of study Bibles that also sometimes signal uh, by, a, by a little footnote if there's a variant. In fact, many good study Bibles do that, mm-hmm. just to show you here's the alternate reading in this text. And if you you do that and you go through them, you'll see uh, often the difference is, is, is not a big difference. I was just going to say, so talking about the canon is kind of like, I don't know, the brother, the sibling of talking about translation a little bit. And um, so I'm, I'm thinking, okay, they're putting it together, putting it together, and there has to be a consistent theme throughout. So obviously the people who are looking at this had to have known some of the original language in order to understand and and catch and capture all of those things that are going seamlessly through or the, the themes of the Bible. Um, so I guess I'm thinking we don't give enough credit <laughs> to the people who actually uh, uh, put together the Bible or, or, or said, hey, these 66 books are consistent or in harmony with what we understand. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I think we often don't recognize their contribution. Yeah. Uh, I think they themselves would tell you we're not deciding which which books. In fact, if if you read the early church fathers, they can they have a they have an extremely high respect for the apostles and they mm. will tell you our writings are not like the apostolic writings. Sure. Right? They're they're not of that authority. We're testifying to that, but we're not the apostles and we're not them. But they do give us the evidence. They preserve them. Yeah. Right, and they go through this process of recognition, and you can see even the fact that there are some uh, some differences in some early, like fourth century and earlier testimony. You have the very fact that they're very concerned about knowing which books actually go back to the apostles. Yeah, and even though many people say 
we don't have lists that are voted on until the fourth century. You have internal evidence hmm. that shows that the vast majority of the New Testament books are already settled very early by the time of Irenaeus. Hmm. Irenaeus quotes uh, as quotes as authoritative. He's very filled with scripture through against heresies uh, and another writing. He quotes from 25 of the 27 books. I think the two books he never references are Philemon and Third John, which are very, very small <laughs> yeah. books. Right. And if you and one one particular person did his dissertation on this, James Hernando, I think was his name. He counted up all the references, all the verses in the New Testament. How many of them did, did Irenaeus quote? And I think it was like 77 point something percent hmm. wow. of the verses in the New Testament just wow. in the writings of Irenaeus himself. Wow. Right. This is AD 180 he's writing. Right. So very early you have the Gospels and Pauline writings are, are Solid, relatively yeah. settled quite early. And then there's a the question of the general epistles and revelation that there's an organic process. Do they really come from the apostles? But even those are being cited quite early by different church fathers. But yes, we owe them a debt of gratitude for being very diligent. First of all, the very yeah. fact that there are differences shows there's not somebody controlling this process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they really did want to know to go back to the apostles. One writing that some people may have heard of is called the shepherd of Hermas. And in some parts of the Christian community, people said, oh, this is inspired writing. Maybe it should be canonical until they realize, oh, it's written too late to be canonical. Mm. And in a book called the Muratorian Fragment, sometimes called the Muratorian, not a book, a writing called the Muratorian Fragment or the Muratorian Canon, he actually says the Shepherd of Hermas was written very recently in our times, in the time of Pius the Bishop of Rome. He mm. gives them by name, which is the mid-2nd century AD. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, it's not apostolic then. It's still good for reading. We still really like it, and we're still going to keep it around. And they did. They copied it. They kept it around. They read it. But it didn't come from the apostles, so it can't be canonical. Mm. This is the way they, they're doing it or organically. And you see these kinds of snippets. We don't have all the history because, again, there's no clearinghouse. Yeah. There's right. no official publisher. Sure. <laughs> there's no emperor who's settling things, right? Yeah. The emperor converts to Christianity in the 4th century, but this is all water. A lot of this is already established and settled long before you have any kind of authority. So it's happening very organically as Christianity is spreading rapidly under persecution yeah. to all over the world. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you look at this, you say, I say, wow, it's amazing how well-preserved scripture is yeah. and the testimony that we have. That that is actually the opposite of what you would expect with a conspiracy or somebody fabricating something where we're going to say, we're going to make sure all these agree. So we're going to gather up the disagreements. We're going to burn them, right? Yeah. right. That, that's happened in, in other yeah. traditions, yeah. but it doesn't. But this is not what we see happening in, in the Christian faith. Wow. In, in the last bit of time that we have, my last question is going to be around, I feel like I... I definitely fall subject to this, and I'm sure some of our listeners do too. Like we want to have something that we can, you know, facilitate a conversation with non-believers mm. uh, to be like, no, this is really true. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the basis and the foundation of our faith is very solid. So where would we begin to have that dialogue with people who, who don't believe uh, in Christ? Like, can we have that dialogue before they are believers? And if we do, how do we, na how do we navigate that? Yeah, I think so. I think we're, we're setting up, I, of course, I believe the canon of scripture is God's canon. But if I say, I can't have a conversation with you, mm -hmm. or we can't make any progress until you already accept that, mm -hmm. then we're not really uh, doing anyone any favors who sure. doesn't already believe what we believe. Yeah. I think I would just want to invite people to consider the possibility so if somebody's completely uh, you know, unsure of the canon, I would say, well, there's a couple of major questions. Uh, is there a personal God who really revealed himself in history? Mm -hmm. If there is, is, do we have anything that we have good reason to believe might have come from this God? And the amazing, even just the spread of Christianity under persecution, I think would count as enough evidence to at least consider the possibility. I'm not saying it makes it true. And then when you think of the early apostles and them giving their lives for this, the ones who, they weren't later generation. They were the ones who lived with Jesus. They traveled where he traveled. They slept where he slept. They saw him. And if he wasn't the real deal, they would have known. Yeah. And then he's really crucified by the Romans. And then they, they say they really met him. And they're willing to testify to that, to the death. Mm -hmm. So I would point back to the Jesus of scriptures. And I would say both if somebody is more maybe analytically minded and they want more hard evidence to go and consider some of this external evidence. But I would also invite everyone, those that are more looking more for, for evidence and those uh, that may not be so inclined to that kind of diligent research, I would recommend that everyone actually just ask, be willing to entertain the possibility that this comes from God mm. and actually read the New Testament mm. and actually ask God if you are there Right? Even if they don't already believe, if you are there, mm. uh, I want to know that you are there. And I know this might not come as a lightning bolt, but I want to read this with an open mind. I ask that you will give me wisdom and they can ask and the living God will hear. Mm -hmm. And many people think I can't, I can't come to God because I don't have enough faith. 
or I'm not good enough. But the gospel tells us differently. First mm-hmm. of all, G- you come as you are and Jesus cleans you up, right? right. <laughs> None of us can clean ourselves. Exactly. And even after we come to Christ, we all have our own messes. Yeah. So don't let that deter you from coming to the living God. Mm-hmm. And second, I always love this story in Mark 9 where you have this, this man who comes to Jesus and he says, my son has been uh, possessed by this unclean spirit who throws him down and tortures him, right? Mm-hmm. And he says, His disi- your disciples couldn't cast him out. Mm-hmm. If you can do anything, mm-hmm. help me. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says to him, if you can, all things are possible mm-hmm. to him who believes. And then the man replies, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Right. And Jesus doesn't say to that man, come back to me when you have more faith. Mm-hmm. He heals his boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Right. I think that's the prayer both for those who might not be believers yet or maybe they're on the road to considering and those of us that would consider us to be very firmly entrenched believers. Mm-hmm. I think this is a prayer we can all pray. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Right. And we will see God not just in the text, not just in historical evidence, but actually the witness of the testimony of the living Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Jesus went away after the resurrection, but he did not leave us alone. Mm -hmm. He told his disciples, I will send you another comforter who is the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, who will testify. And that testimony counts as evidence. Right. Right. it won't convince you, right? My testimony it might help you. It might help you to consider. But I can't say because I've witnessed the Holy Spirit, that's proof for you. Mm-hmm. But it counts as evidence for me. Mm-hmm. It's only a Western Enlightenment mindset that's told us, no, you need to have objective evidence. What, where, where's objective evidence? Mm-hmm. As soon as you're considering it, it's already going through your subjective filters. Yeah. There's yeah. no neutral ground. Yeah. It's not that we start with disbelief in God and then try to reason our way to belief. Mm-hmm. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. So starting with belief in God, or at least the possibility of belief in God, is at least as reasonable a position as the opposite. And in fact, unless we're very ethnocentric and Western-centric, the majority of people who have lived throughout the world and all through history have believed in supernatural beings, many of them in monotheism. Mm -hmm. So the idea of considering this, we've been told kind of a myth, we've been fed by the Enlightenment, Mm -hmm. that you need to have some kind of objective proof and certainty. But that that way cannot meet its own standard. Mm -hmm. If you go that way, you will be a skeptic of everything. I'm not talking about religious faith. You'll be a skeptic just about everyday things. If I'm a skeptic about everything, Mm -hmm. how do I know my wife loves me? Mm -hmm. Right. Now, I have a lot of evidence that my wife loves me, much more than I deserve. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> sure. But maybe she's the greatest con artist in the history of the world mm. right. in her own mind, right? Mm. She's, she's just acting. She's a really good actor. I can't know with 100% certainty that she loves me. I could come up with some scenario, mm-hmm. some just-so story, that all of the evidence that points in this direction isn't really there. I could poke holes. I could say I'm 99.5% sure, but that last 0.5%, I'm not sure I can stay. I'm not sure I can be in this relationship because I'm just not 100% sure. sure. That would never work. Right. And it would be completely counterproductive because I have more than enough evidence that she does love me. But at the end of the day, there's always a decision of faith. Yeah. Yeah. And even if, I, even if I could know with 100% certainty she loves me now, I could never know with 100% certainty that she'll love me tomorrow Mm -hmm. or next week Mm -hmm. or a month later, right? I might get hurt, right? Now, I have every reason to believe otherwise Mm -hmm. because she is a wonderful wife and I mean that sincerely. (laughs) Every reason to believe otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about 100% certainty, that standard does not work. Mm -hmm. So anyone who's wrestling with this, ask yourself, am I dealing with a fair standard, Mm -hmm. Sure. right? Every worldview requires some decision of faith. I don't mean just religion faith. Decision of what you will believe. Even an empirical that is based on five senses of of the scientific method requires some decision of faith. Why do you believe your senses are reliable? Mm. Why do you believe that your cognitive faculties lead towards truth? Mm -hmm. If we are just the result of survival by the fittest, why think that truth matters to the way that our our brains came to be on that kind of a scenario? Mm -hmm. So again, I would encourage people to apply the same standard to this mm. biggest question that they apply in their everyday life. Right. When you sit on a chair, you don't say, this chair might not support me, so I'm not going to sit on it. Right. You sit on the chair, right? When you go out and you drive your car, uh, if your brakes fail, that's going to be a big problem. But most right. of us don't check our brakes every time that we drive, mm. right? We don't operate with 100% certainty. That is a myth of the enlightenment. Mm. And when we clear away that myth, there's actually a level ground. The question is not whether you will have faith. And again, by this, I just mean belief in something. Mm-hmm. It doesn't even have to be religious faith. The question is not whether you will have faith. It is where will you place your faith? Mm-hmm. And everyone places their faith somewhere. Mm-hmm. And in, in my view, the best place to, to place faith is in Jesus who died for us and loves us and rose from the dead. And I'm convicted both by the historical witness and by the witness in my own life and what I've seen in other people's lives that this is true. Yeah. And so I would just invite people to, that, to consider that as well.
We're so glad you joined us this week as we talk with Dr. John Peckham on the canonicity and reliability of scripture. Recommended reading for this week include his book, Canonical Theology, The Biblical Canon, Sola Scriptura, and Theological Method, along with other books like Lee Strobel's Case for Christ and Dr. Gary Habermas's book, Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. We want to thank the Adventist Learning Community for making this program possible, as well as our guest, Dr. John C. Peckham. If you're not already following us on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, be sure to do so at the handle AdventNext. Some of you have been writing in with requests for future episodes. Please continue to do so. I love hearing your suggestions and we're doing our best to get the guests that you recommend. Thanks so much for tuning in and see you next week.